Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to start off our event for today, our book um, introduction, Queer Judaism, LGBT Activism, and the Remaking of Jewish Orthodoxy in Israel. This event is brought to you by the YNS Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. I am Tamar Hoffnung, the Israel Institute Fellow at the Center, and I'm delighted to introduce to you the author of the book, Orita Vishai, who is a professor of sociology and women's gender and sexuality studies at Fordham University, where she is affiliated with the Center on Jewish Studies. She has law degrees from Tel Aviv University and the Yale Law School and a PhD in sociology from University of California, Berkeley. Orit has spent much of her career studying how Orthodox Jews experience Jewish frameworks that regulate gender, sexuality, and desire. Her book, which she will introduce today, Queer Judaism, LGBT Activism and the Remaking of Jewish Orthodoxy in Israel, was published by New York University Press in 2023. She's now writing about Yeshiva University students' attempt to start a pride club on their campus. Um, welcome, Orit. It's a delight to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the center for inviting me. Thank you, Tamar, for um, moderating this event. Thank you for to Gage, Gage Greenspan for all the work behind the scenes and to Dove Voxman for organizing this. Um, so before I begin, um, I just want to acknowledge that um, giving this talk at a time when everything Israel related is fraught and seen through the lens of the events of October 7th and its aftermath. And for those of you who are at UCLA in particular, um, after in the aftermath of what you've seen on your campus. Um, so, and it seems that we're like in a catch 22 situation talking about anything that's not October 7th related, um, sometimes seems less relevant. Um, and we want to maybe have other conversations about Israeli society, culture, and politics. Um, but of course, all those inevitably intersect with the present. So I'll be doing both, sort of. Um, I'll stick to my lane as an ethnographer who studied a particular corner of Israeli culture and politics. Um, but of course, we're always bringing it um, to um, the present. So my book, Queer Judaism, is about the evolving relationship between Orthodox Judaism and queer identities. And I use Orthodox here to refer to what we think of in the US or in the UK as the equivalent of modern Orthodox. But in Israel, this refers to the demographic category um, of Tzioni Dati Lumi, or Zionist Religious Nationalist. And keep this terminology in mind because it will be very important later. Um, the book and my talk um, tell three intertwined stories. The first one is how it feels to be. What does it feel like to be Orthodox and queer in Israel? Um, so this part of the book focuses on the lived experience and what it reveals religion to be as simultaneously a productive and destructive force in people's lives. And the important word here is, is simultaneously. The second story is one of activism. So it tells the story of how Orthodox queer persons advocated for acceptance and inclusion. And while their strategies, as I'll uh, describe, uh, varied um, significantly, those strategies converged on two key characteristics, um, a rhetoric of authenticity. So make space for us because we are of you, we are like you, we are Orthodox or from Orthodox backgrounds and a political strategy of moderation. So this is a version of activism and queer activism in particular um, that generally doesn't seek to upend social systems, but works to make change from within. In practice, what this means is that while Orthodox queer activists critically questioned one set of binaries, hierarchies, rules of inclusion, and those would be Orthodox Judaism's privileging of heterosexuality and cisgender identities, um, these activists left unexamined other sets of hierarchies, 
Um, and these would include ethnic, Ashkenazi, Mizrahi questions, and most importantly, the Palestinian question. What connects these two threads of activism and the lived experience is the importance of community. So first, creating one um, underground and secret, then gaining a public presence, visibility to provide support for others and to combat community stereotypes, practices, and norms. The book's final story is about the relationship between orthodoxy and queerness. And here the book speaks to much broader dynamics of the evolving nature of orthodoxy itself at a time of heated political upheaval. Um, when I wrote the book, that upheaval referred to the general political climate of explosive culture wars between liberal and illiberal forces, um, where religion and gender and sexuality were extremely divisive, but this is not unique to Israel by any stretch of the imagination. The book went to press right before the battle over the constitutional overhaul or coup um, began, but it documents processes that foreshadow it. And in hindsight, it also foreshadowed the Israeli progressive left, and that would include queer activists, um, genuine bewilderment um, at uh, a sense of being abandoned by international progressive movements. So together these stories, and I will elaborate on them um, for the rest of the talk, um, converge um, in an analysis of a dynamic of entanglements of religion, politics, gender, and sexuality, and the profound impact on people's lives. So queer Judaism is a pre-October 7th story, but as we will see the tensions that Orthodox persons straddle, especially in their activist rhetoric, have great resonance in the uh, post-October 7th world. So a quick word about methodology, and I don't want to spend too much time here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the book is spent on several years, and by that I mean five or six, depending on how you count that, uh, of research with the proud relig religious community in Israel Kehila Datid Ge'a, or uh, as it's known by its acronym, Kadad in Hebrew. This is a loose organization, um, a, a loose network of organizations and individuals who identify as lesbian, queer, or LGBTQ, and are Orthodox Jews or are from Orthodox backgrounds. So I include in that category those who grew up in the community but disaffiliated and disaffiliated also has lots of different nuances. My main focus was on same-sex attracted persons. I interviewed over 120 Orthodox uh, queer persons, activists, family members, and allies, um, including rabbis and rabbiniot. I observed in physical and online spaces where they come together to worship, advise one another, socialize, study, and advocate for their right to be present in Orthodox spaces. Lastly, um, I will note that I come to this project as an ethnographer. So I, and who is an outsider to both communities. I am not Orthodox. I was not raised as Orthodox and I do not identify as queer. Um, and my goal has been to tell the story from the perspective who lived through it. Um, so my departure point is this puzzle. Until fairly recently, Orthodox Jewish persons in Israel could not imagine embracing queer identities and staying within the Orthodox fold. Um, then within the span of about 15 years from the, thank you, um, from the mid 2000s to the early 2020s, Orthodox queer persons came out of the shadows and they articulated um, these individual and collective identities as both and, um, queer and orthodox. And the book, book asks, well, how did this happen? And what are the implications for queer individuals, for their families, for their communities, for Jewish leadership, for Jewish theology, and importantly, for the very concept of what it means to be an orthodox Jew? So I want to start kind of to set the stage uh, by uh, sharing a few um, personal stories and we can go way back. Um, thank you. Um, so 
The first story is one uh, um, by someone who I call Ayelet, and of course, um, these are um, um, details are are changed, so no one can actually be identified. So I first met Ayelet in 2017. She was warning the quote picture of what life was supposed to look like. She was closeted in her late twenties and occasionally dated men. Um, Ayelet had hoped that she would be able to marry a man and have quote, a real wedding with a chuppah, a wedding canopy, and a shattered glass, which is part of the um, Jewish wedding ceremony, rather than shattered dreams. Ayelet had known from a very young age that something was, quote, wrong with her, and that she was, quote, different. Her friends would speak endlessly about boys, but she kept having crushes on female teachers, youth movement counselors, um, and she kept all of it a secret and, quote, prayed for this to change that I'll be normal. I caught up with her a couple of years later, as I said, this was a long-term study, um, and she was still mostly closeted, celibate, and she said that she felt stuck. At this point, everyone around her was married with children, and friends and family had stopped trying to set her up with eligible men because she had declined too many offers, which was a relief. Um, and I'll add here that marriage rates um, among the Orthodox um, in Israel are quite high and people tend to marry um, quite young, early 20s. Many of Ayelet's friends ended up settling in the same type of tight-knit Orthodox neighborhood or West Bank settlement uh, where they grew up. And this had been her part of a, a, her life plan, but orthodox spaces were not hospitable to single women or single mothers, never mind same-sex couples. They're more hospitable now. Um, Ayala also said that she was drifting away from orthodoxy because she felt that as a single woman, she was shut out of what she liked most about orthodoxy. Um, and that would be community, home, and rituals. But she was stuck because, or mainly because, she could not imagine of uh, building a life with another woman. So, and lifelong messages from family, friends, teachers, rabbis ran too deep. And it's not insignificant here that her father is a well-known Orthodox rabbi and educator. Benny uh, realized that he was gay in early adolescence. At his bar mitzvah, he said that he felt like a hypocrite because he knew that he was never going to be able to fully realize Jewish male adulthood which included in his mind a real Jewish home with a wife and children. One of the first calls he placed when he got a cell phone was to a conversion therapy organization. His contact there told him that it was possible to change and assured him that he would change, but there was time. He was only 15 at the time, so he waited. In the meantime, he also continued to have crushes, a best friend, a classmate, a youth group counselor. Um, when he was a little older, he contacted um, a therapist who was rumored to, quote, help men in a situation. In hindsight, he realized that this was a conversion therapy attempt. Um, he didn't pursue this, but this episode accelerated a crisis of faith that was already brewing. Um, he was referred to this um, supposed therapist by a very trusted rabbi. Benny then joined a conservative gay men's organization uh, because he was seeking emotional support. This particular organization folded a couple of years ago. Um, that group brought him no closer to making this thing, as he called it, go away, but kind of naturally he met his first boyfriend there. Um, meanwhile, things just became urgent. His friends were getting married and having children. His younger siblings, of which he had several, were getting married and having children. So his life plan was upended. Um, like Ayala, that life plan included um, living in a settlement where he grew up um, and teaching at the local school and gays were just unwelcome in both spaces. When I crossed paths with him again, a few years later, he was in a monogamous relationship with an ex-Orthodox man and they were planning to start a family. Um, they said that they would send their kids to Orthodox school, and it did, since then they've had a baby via surrogate. Um, what had been a pre preposterous proposition a decade earlier now seemed feasible. For Benny, the turning point came when he recognized that, quote, this thing was never going to go away. Um, so he said he was just going to live. 
um, his life. And this is, he sort of said it casually, as did many of my interviewees, uh, but it's important to note that suicidal ideation is alarmingly high among queer youth and even more widespread among LGBTQ uh, persons of faith from all um, different kinds of faith backgrounds. Then he made another decision. His primary commitment was going to be to himself, not as parents, not as rabbis or siblings or community. This may sound like a very logical route to achieving well-being, but this is not always a priority in Jewish ethics, which tends to be more communally oriented. Then he also knew that he would need to find an alternative accepting Orthodox congregation. It was in the context of worshiping in such a community that Benny came to identify as Orthodox and gay. So I start with these stories because they capture um, key way stations in the lives of many same attracted Orthodox Jews I spoke to. This idea of a shattered life plans, a chaotic aftermath and a new life plan that entailed what I call reimagining or rescripting what it means to be Orthodox. They also capture the entanglements of personal lives and the changing political landscape around them. And with these two personal stories in mind, I want to now elaborate on the book's three themes. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first, oh, there is, okay, next one. Yes, uh, the lived experience. What does it feel? What does it mean to be orthodox and queer? So, in the popular imagination, this idea of religious and queer seems to be um, an oxymoron or a paradox. Like, And what drives such perception is this idea that there is something inherently contradictory about being religious and queer. Many religious traditions and Orthodox Judaism certainly does not have a monopoly on this, um, have a horrendous track record when it comes to queer lives. People have been and are being subjected to silencing, excommunication, out, outing, shame, conversion therapy. And I came across numerous examples how orthodoxy, social structures, institutions, cultural messages, politics, and just general culture create hardships for queer orthodox persons. Um, and in fact, I have a whole chapter in the book where I document experiences of shame, secrecy, denial, repression, spiritual harms, theological angst, and family dramas um, that together result in this idea of a shattered life plan um, that I described in the personal narratives earlier. For example, one man um, who I call Uri told me that when he realized he was gay, he went through, he and his parents went through a period of, quote, mourning because there it was a death. There was a dream, a big dream, and it was gone. So the dream was caught up in this utopic idea about normative Orthodox families, a mother who wears a head covering and possibly hates it because this practice is fraught in or progressive Orthodox circles, a mother who blesses over the candles, a father who does the kiddush um, and takes the children to synagogue. This sort of utopic family might reside in a settlement or another Orthodox community. So Uli likened the men and the women and the families and the communities that populate, that, that populate this um, idealized version of Orthodox life to a scenery in a play. Quote, when you grow up in such a home, in such a community, the scenery is all around you, what the home is supposed to look like, the family, and it rubs off on you. So the tragedy is that many Orthodox queer persons subscribe to this vision, um, but heteronormative Orthodox adulthood was simply out of reach. Until the 2010s or mid 2010s, Orthodoxy did not offer an alternative. And this was when, um, and I'll describe this in a minute, when Orthodox queer persons themselves began to circulate such images. Then there are family dramas. So family dynamics are central nodes in many queer narratives. But orthodoxy pre presents a particularly rough terrain. Um, so orthodox families tend to be large and there's a steady stream of family obligations, wedding, funerals, bris, bar mitzvahs, holiday gatherings, Shabbat dinners. Um, so orthodox queer 
persons have to account for a very large cast of characters, grandparents, aunts, great aunts, nephews, cousins. There's constant negotiations of who to tell, when and how, and this could unfold over decades sometime in some cases. But uh, next slide, please. Uh, religion was not only a destructive force in, their, in people's lives. Um, and this is one of the main takeaways in my book. Religion can also be a positive productive force in the life of queer Orthodox Jews and within their larger communities. So another chapter in the book um, considers the future made possible when a group of previously silenced people re-envisions what it means to be, in this case, what it means to be Orthodox Jew. The catch is that they devise what I call new scripts for living, in part by drawing on the same religious tradition that and mobilizing its logics, its language, its sensibilities to make sense of themselves. In the process, what they do is make um, new ways of think thinking, create new way of thinking of what it means to be orthodox. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, next one. One example comes from um, same-sex weddings. So you probably know what traditional Orthodox weddings um, look like. I just pulled off something that I thought would capture this off the internet. Um, but they're highly structured, ritualized, and gendered, right? So there's a couple, a man and a woman. They stand under the chuppah, the wedding canopy, in gendered coded clothing. Um, the wedding ceremony is conducted by a male rabbi in, in, in this context. The man signs a wedding contract, the ketubah, which accounts for the groom's rights and responsibility towards the bride and blesses her with a ring and then shatters the glass. And the ceremony is laden with nationalist references. The wedding canopy symbolizes the new Jewish home that will be built by the couple, implied heterosexual couple. The broken glass serves as a reminder of the foundational and traumatic events in Jewish history, um, the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem. So for same-sex couples, um, next slide, please. This is all up for negotiation. So one interview told me, quote, when we decided to get married, not a commitment ceremony, but a real Jewish wedding, we realized that we had to make all these decisions. Can we stand under a chuppah? this couple and many others um, did what Jews traditionally do when they have hard questions. They dove into the Jewish archives, into Jewish sources, and they consulted rabbis, they consulted friends, they consulted family, um, and asked, what makes a wedding Jewish? So in 2017, this photo of um, an Orthodox same-sex wedding went viral by design. So these two Orthodox presenting men stood under the chuppah with, um, and we, we don't see kind of the, 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 the crowd, the audience, I call them, or their guests. Um, but the, the, it was a very mixed crowd and a very religious looking crowd with kippahs and tassels and headdresses and skirts. Um, it looked like a typical Orthodox wedding, but these were the groom and groom. Um, the ceremony was conducted by a yeshiva trained trans woman um, and both grooms broke the glass um, and they recited the traditional psalm, if I forget you Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. And guests um, shared videos of, and photos of the wedding on social media in real time um, and they all had a common message they were witnessing history. And here is an authentic Orthodox same-sex wedding. And it was an authentic Orthodox wedding because this is how the grooms um, self-identified. So to summarize this point, Orthodox queer persons often experience Judaism as a destructive force that shatters their self-perceptions and dreams. But it also 
is experienced as a productive force, um, which provides an opportunity to make a new Jewish identity. And the emphasis here that this all comes from within the tradition. But there's a twist here. The construction of a new language, ritual, and social scripts can only emerge in community. So to understand the dynamics and realities of contemporary queer lives, we also need to understand the history of how we got there. And this is the book's second um, theme of activism. So 20 years ago, next slide, or it might be out of order. It, you know what, it's, the, it's that first slide with a rabbi further up and then we can come back here. Um, 20 years ago, um, this uh, uh, rabbi, um, Shlomo Aviner, who's a very conservative Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And when I use conservative here, it's like a small C conservative. So not the denomination, but just a descriptor. Um, so he announced there's no such thing as a religious homosexual. And he was nominally correct in the sense that very few Orthodox people identified as gay or lesbian at the turn of the 21st century. Um, of course, they were there. They were just um, under the radar. They feared um, exposure, so they were silent. Fast forward to 2020, um, a leading rabbi associated with a progressive wing of orthodoxy, Dr. Rabbi Benny Lau, issued theological guidelines that were intended to help some observant Jews, namely those in same-sex, monogamous, long-term relationships, manage their family lives in accordance with Jewish customs and laws. This guidance was kind of a theological earthquake, um, but also a political one because it was the first time that a mainstream or mainstream adjacent rabbi really publicly acknowledged alternatives to this idea that there's no such thing. Um, rabbi Lau was one of the uh, Orthodox leaders to have been in dialogue with a proud religious community um, from the very start. Um, and like other allies, he knew by 2020 that there were plenty of people um, living in this new reality, Orthodox queer Jews who were living in alternative families who wanted, needed, and most importantly, deserved um, a halachic theological guidance to do so. So this was a product of activism um, uh, of the proud religious community. And I want to just give you a taste of some of this activism. So forward to um, a few slides, please. Um, yep, right there. So one key strategy or one, one key um, uh, uh, sort of strategic um, uh, um, mode of activism was creating alternatives to religious spaces that stigmatized, rejected, or harmed Orthodox queer people. So in the mid-2000s, several Orthodox um, or, our organizations began operating um, publicly. Here we see some of them, Chavruta, which is the gay men's organization, Batkol, which is the Orthodox women's uh, uh, lesbian organization. And in the early 2020s, both expanded their, um, their mission and vision and also their titles to include queer. Um, in 2009, a proud minyan um, began operating in the LGBT center in Tel Aviv on the high holidays and a first inclusive synagogue opened in, in the heart of Tel Aviv. And then there were plenty of other initiatives like a queer learning group, um, next slide, um, support groups, social groups um, that offer everything from like movie nights and Shabbats to holiday, holiday celebrations and queer um, spaces, queer um, learning spaces. Um, and we know from other research, these safe spaces are important for individuals, but they're also important um, because they help foster collective identities um, as in this case for queer as queer people of faith. Another key strategy has been dialogue with community members, um, including religious leaders, um, therapists, educators. So the goal here is to help dispel an enduring, enduring stereotypes through interventions that educate the community about LGBTQ issues and importantly, LGBTQ lives. Uh, one of the organizations um, that, that emerged at that time is called Cheval. Um, um, literally has as its mission to educate communities 
through dialogue. Um, they train volunteers to tell their orthodox queer stories. And these workshops that are very powerful begin with a brief introduction um, at the end of which the volunteer declares, my name is so-and-so, and I am an orthodox lesbian, gay, trans person. So the words are spoken by the person right there with an audience. And after they tell the story, they engage in Q&A. Um, next slide, please. Um, in the book, I recount an event from 2016 uh, when during a conference uh, in which um, a policy paper, a ground paper, uh, groundbreaking policy paper about acceptance of gays and lesbians in Orthodox communities, um, activist Nadav Schwartz, who is pictured here, recounted that he invited a rabbi to join him for an evening at cruising. So the backstory was that a group of rabbis affiliated with a liberal Beit Hillel organization that hosted this event uh, was putting finishing touches on a position paper um, that advocated um, tolerance. But an early draft, which was shared with the activists, um, alarmed them because it created this equivalency between one night, one -night stands and long-term monogamous same-sex relationships. So Nadav said at the conference, quote, a decisor cannot make halacha before he knows the reality. So I invited the rabbi for an evening of cruising for casual sex so that he can see the reality. The rabbis, after the exchange with the um, activists, um, changed their position and in a footnote also acknowledged the activist input. And just to be clear, this was a hypothetical. There was never going to be an evening of cruising. Um, but this, the point was to sort of to drive home this idea that you cannot make halakha without consulting the people who are impacted. So activists are, are, have been super busy. They also produce books, articles, pamphlets, social media posts. Um, they launched many public visibility campaigns. Next slide. Um, this is uh, one of them. It's called Our Faces. This is from 20, uh, late 2015. It says we are um, LGBTQ from religious backgrounds. And th there was a whole kind of visibility campaign telling each of their stories. Um, and then when all else fail, fails, of course, there's protests. Next slide. Um, and um, pride parades. This is from the pride parade in Jerusalem, uh, where every year um, the the uh, religious community, um, many in the religious community will hold um, these banners identifying themselves uh, from either their uh, neighborhood or what um, schools they studied at. And many of them are, are or yeshivas. So um, staking a claim. Um, so to summarize this point, like other religious, like other movements, the proud religious community activated numerous and sometimes contradictory mechanisms of social change, tearing things down versus working from within the fold. Um, the, but the fight for inclusivity, I also should say, is far from over, but there are dramatic shifts and they're palatable. Orthodox persons went from being silenced and uniformly vilified to establishing this strong presence and sometimes very, very positive visibility, and then this network of organizations. The big question is why these strategies worked, um, and other than various um, sort of external forces, I identify two of them. The first is that they pra practice a politics of moderation. So they worked from within the system, right? They avoided rocking the boat, right? Their, their line is like, we come in peace. Second, and this is perhaps the most important point, they are centered on what I call a rhetoric of authenticity. Make space for us because we are like you, we are of you, we are Orthodox Jews, we may love a little differently, our families are a little different, but we're like you. Um, so one activist said um, at, an, at a 2018 event, quote, we're not seeking to destroy the institution of the straight family. All we want is a room of our own within the Jewish home. And this is where things get complicated. 
in Israel, religious and nationalist sentiments are deeply intertwined. So the Jewish home in which the proud religious community seeks a home is also the name of a nationalist right-wing political party. That party dissolved, but its vision lives on in other nationalist parties such as Noam and Otsma Yehudit. In English, it's known as the National Front or Jewish Power. This would be Ben Gvir's party. So the Jewish home is not an abstract notion, um, and it's a political as much as it is a religious home. Um, and this is where I'm going with this. Orthodox queer persons may criticize religious communities, political and, and political parties, homophobia and transphobia, but they're often aligned with ethno-nationalism. So this leads me to the third story in, or the third theme in the book. Um, and, you know, what queer Judaism reveals about negotiations of the boundaries of Orthodox Judaism. This is what I call a remaking of orthodoxy. Next slide. So one thing that, or next slide, <laughs> and next slide. Um, so you may be wondering if Orthodox Judaism makes the life of queer folks so difficult, why do they insist on stay, staying? Right? There are other options out there, even in Israel. And the answer is that Orthodox queer persons who demand a room of their own within the Jewish home are not only advocating for acceptance, they're also engaging in a battle over Orthodoxy's boundaries and who has the um, power or the authority to define these boundaries. So here's how activist Danielle Jonas put it in 2020 when he was asked this question. Why do you insist on the Orthodox label, even though there are other options? And this is what he said. I think we're, this is previous slide. Um, nope, sorry, next, 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 yes, sorry. Um, if I stop defining myself as Orthodox, we will allow the Orthodox community to say what used to be true, that LGBT persons don't exist here. Now they can no longer say that. We insist on our place within the Orthodox community so that we feel comfortable. It's also about not letting them feel comfortable without us. So it's small wonder that Orthodox conservatives um, consider Orthodox LGBT, LGBT persons as an existential threat. And this is how um, another conservative uh, rabbi responded to um, a public visibility campaign that showed Orthodox queer persons with family members um, with the idea of showing kind of acceptance. Next slide. When someone comes and turns family acceptance into communal acceptance, we will not accept him into the family. It is hard because it's our son. But if that's what they do with it, the it being acceptance, we will uh, have to stop with family acceptance. If you do not disturb us, we will not disturb you. If he lives with his partner, it's his problem, not mine. Once he waves it like a flag, we cannot accept him. So... Just listen to this rhetoric. Kadug on the one hand insists that they come in peace. The conservatives say any departure from the cis and heteronormative social order, including coming to Shabbat dinner with one's life partner, um, is an existential threat, right? Those portrayed to be disturbing us are not some intruders, infiltrators. They're born and raised within the community. What the source of disruption is their insistence on living a life that honors their sexual or orientation and gender identity. So what I'm suggesting that these debates, whether one can be orthodox and, and queer, are actually debates about the bounds of authentic orthodox Judaism. Um, and the original subtitle of the book was The Battle for Orthodoxy's Straight Soul, and the press wouldn't let me use it, but that captures the essence. Who can be? How far can you stretch tradition? Who makes the call of who is in and who's out? So, and this leads me to my very last point. For a very long time, the debates about who can be orthodox and queer um, was intersectorial within orthodox communities. And in recent years though, this has taken on a national urgency. 
Um, so as Israeli citizens went to the polls five times between 2019 and 2021, it seemed like heteronormativity and cisnormativity were repeatedly on the ballot with extreme parties such as Noam running in the national elections. Next slide. Um, and so this says Israel chooses to be normal. The what sort of the, the 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 ballot says that my son will marry a woman kind of was the this party's tagline. They have a Knesset member now um, who's part of the ruling coalition. Um, throughout the year-long protest of uh, um, Bibi's legal coup in 2023, this question of sexual diversity kind of became front and center. But what's also important to note is that this blatant mix of religious, xenophobic, ultra-nationalist, homophobic, transphobic, sexist ideologies came um, into clearer focus as a unified agenda. Again, Israel is not unique here. Um, so these various extreme right-wing wing parties um, that are now part of the governing coalition um, chose that kind of as part of their line. And I noted earlier, or in Hebrew Orthodox is often used interchangeably with religious Zionist nationalist. This marks a demographic category, a political category, not just a religious one. Um, and this convergence of conservative reactionary agendas in the religious Zionist camp leads me to this question um, and, or final point that I wanna make and circles back to some of the larger questions about Israel in the post-October 7th world. For a long time, the proud religious community made the case for acceptance based on the idea that Orthodox queer persons were not just like other queer, um, like w w were just like other Orthodox people. What this implied was that regardless of divergence of, quest of gender and sexual politics, they were part of the religious Zionist fold. But this becomes fraught. How can you support the undoing of one set of oppressive practices that would be religious and gender or sexual regimes, but still support another set of oppressive practices, national, intra-religious? So there is a tension between, on the one hand, sort of being critical of Orthodox parties, sexist, homophobic, transphobic rhetoric, but on the other hand, aligning with nationalist, um, ethno-nationalist rhetoric. So on the one hand, the book and the talk are about hope for a marginalized group. It illustrates how Orthodox queer um, Israeli Jews have found meaning within their tradition and cleverly harnessed it to influence Judaism, orthodoxy, and Israeli society more generally. On the other hand, the hallmarks of the proud religious community's success, claiming authenticity within the ethno-nationalist context of Israeli orthodoxy also raises difficulties um, because of this lack of solidarity with other marginalized groups and specifically the silence on broader social justice issues, especially the Palestinian questions. Um, when I wrote Queer Judaism, I pondered the inherent limitations of a movement for social change. And we can close the, um, the slideshow. Um, so I really pondered this, this inherent limitation of the movement for social change that is not fully in solidarity with other groups. Um, and one of my points was social change is complicated, it's complex. Um, and in a post-October 7th world, when progressive groups in Israel who have yet to grapple with questions of the occupation and ethno-nationalisms, these limitations take on much broader significance. So they capture this conundrum that has been felt and articulated by many progressive groups in Israel um, queer and otherwise who feel kind of deserted by natural allies outside of Israel. The political rhetoric that Orthodox queer activists invokes, invoke gives us a preview of these broader dynamics because they refer to longstanding questions about whether movements for social change 
that do not question the totality of power relations can ever really succeed. Still, these tensions and dynamics do not detract, I would argue, from the real on the ground change that has occurred, is occurring within Orthodox communities. Or to put it more abstract terms, it's tempting to reduce political and cultural debates into, clear, into very clear binaries, progressive, oppressive, chain makers, supporters of the status quo. But as an ethnographer who had spent a lot of time in the field, um, I want to counter that the lived experience forces us to consider complexities, nuances, and inherent tensions. And I will end with that. Thank you so much, Arid, for this really, really fascinating talk. Um, I actually studied in college with uh, Daniel Iona, so it was really nice to, mm -hmm. see, to see him uh, on your presentation. Um, even then, he was a very, very active um, and charismatic activist, so that was uh, really nice uh, to see him. Um, I wanted to ask you, in terms of these kind of negotiation, to what extent do Orthodox communities who resist um, or Orthodox leaders who resist, um, to what extent do they use um, the rhetoric of lehachis to enrage with for ultra-Orthodox um, Jews is really this idea that, you know, so long as you, so that, that really if you kind of show your presence to kind of devaluing some of the rules, um, that is really seen as a infringement and, and it's very, seen very much. To what extent does that play a role um, in these dynamics that you encounter? It's, it's definitely part of the rhetoric. So every year, maybe not this year, but but like every year until now, right? There's this dance like around the Jerusalem Pride Parade. Yes. And even most of the aligned rabbis, right? Those who, so, so rab, rabbis who are well-known allies who support the community um, will ask them like, wh are you, why, wh why do you need to like, to, to show yourself out there in space? Like, like this, this idea, right. like, yeah. Okay. So this, this, this is part, part of that. What, and the activist counter, we're not, he, th that is not our goal. Right. Yeah. Is it strategically a, a little part of it? Sure, but but really for 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 the for Orthodox um, or and again, just to remind you, when I say Orthodox, I'm referring to modern Orthodox, and I'm also referring to people who had grew up Orthodox and disaffiliated part of that group. Especially when it comes to the Jerusalem Pride Parade, they say no, it's not. It's our goal is not to rachis. Our goal is not just to like to be in your face. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to be present. It is our right to be present. And it is also important for you, our Orthodox community, to see us as present. And they're always saying it's for that 16-year-old in some, then they name some settlement deep in 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 um, the West Bank who's closeted and has no other visibility. It's for him or it's for a 16-year-old me. And when we talk about generally, when we speak about um, when we speak about the you know the 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 general kind of struggle of LGBT community in Israel, one of the most important things I think um, kind of for bringing the LGBTQ community um, and to more acceptance has been really their ability to start and form a family that has been for many, um, that has been for many kind of a, a way or to, to what extent is forming a family play in the dynamics that you see? Is it different from, from, from the, the larger, um, the, the larger struggle? Or is it unique in any way or is it um, the same? Does that make it easier for them to kind of uh, be accepted? So it's always been, the, the answer is kind of yes and yes and yes. But so that rhetoric had been very central to the proud religious communities, right? So the Orthodox um, activists, um, rhetoric but 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 real goals right because you know they 
the Orthodox community in general is family oriented. Now, these are um, dynamics that have been occurring in, in queer communities in general, in definitely queer communities of faith, not just Orthodox, um, but, 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 but also more generally, right? Sort of this um, marriage and, and having children. But, but it's been on steroids uh, when we come to the um, uh, proud religious community. Um, and it was a, it was an early talking point, um, but but also part of the lived experience, um, and very central to educating communities. This is who we are. This is what we want. We want a family just like yours, right? We want you know a room of our own in the Jewish home, right? We 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 want that just with a same sex spouse. And it's one of the um, arguments that allied rabbis make for tolerance, for finding um, sort of halachic um, um, frameworks that would allow um, same sex couples and importantly same-sex families to exist within halachic um you know within orthodox communities within a halachic framework yes right the children yeah and so, so that I, actually, yeah go ahead yeah yeah so that actually touches on a question um that andrea smith um raised and that is um how does the uh, israeli lgbt community deal with the halachic tradition and biblical interpretations <laughs> Um, you can right. elaborate a little bit more of course you started elaborating um answering this question so yeah right the million dollar question right so several ways um and one of them is yes you know there's that phrase in leviticus and it's there and by the way christians have to deal with that with that phrase um just as 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 orthodox jews do um, and some will say, and um, so Rabbi Steve Green Greenberg um, wrote about wrote a book um, about this in like 2005 was, was sort of one, one of the first people kind of to 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 write about this as sort of providing alternative ways of, of, of interpreting like a halakhic interpretation, alternative halakhic interpretations of that phrase that it does not apply to long term uh, monogamous um, relationships. It applies to other contexts. So one that's one strategy. Another strategy um, that I heard from many of the people that I worked with was, you know, that phrase exists, or you know that pasuk. Um, there are all sorts of um, um, mitzvot, or there are all sorts of of stringencies that Jews can't meet, and Jews live with these complexities and tensions, and that's just the way it is. Um, lesbians will point out that formally the that phrase the pasuk doesn't apply to women so we can even you know put that aside and then others will say we again e even if halakhically doesn't apply to women still culturally and and like historically it, it kind of has so we're we are in the same boat as the men but ultimately the message is don't see us only don't reduce us to yeah. just our sexual lives, right? That is deeply offensive. We are full human beings with full Jewish lives. And that phrase, that pasuk is just one part of it. Um, another strategy is like, basically don't come into our bedrooms, right? How right. many people actually follow Nida practices like to, to the letter? Many don't you don't do, you know, and you still allow them to come to synagogue and you don't shame them and you give them aliot and, and you know, don't come into our bedrooms. Um, that is deeply offensive. So the short answer is many different strategies, um, you know, that really span, right, span the kinds of strategies that we, we, we see uh, with regards to other points of activism. And do they at all try to be more restrictive on it? Is there this phenomena of trying to be more restrictive in other areas of, of religious observance as part of? So for some, some, right? Some. So one of my favorite examples, right, is um, for lesbians. So same sex uh, uh, women couple. Do you wear a head covering? Do you observe Jewish menstrual practices? Now, 
I mean, there's an irony there because within progressive, again, I'm orthodox circles, but progressive orthodox circles, both <laughs> head covering and uh, observing Nida, Jewish menstrual practices are really fraught, really debated, um, all sorts of um, astringencies are, are, are um, poured over and criticized and sort of rethought. But for many Orthodox LGBTQ people, right? The halakha becomes important because if there's no halakha for you, you're by definition outside the camp, right? You don't count. So people will ask rabbis, right? Make halakha for us mm -hmm. for how to live our lives halakhically within the tradition. So again, like the hair covering, um, saying shema, in, in, you know, uh, upon awakening in the morning, what, you know, you're in the same, in this, in the same bed with, with a same sex spouse, right? So make halacha for us. That's why Rabbi Benny Laos, um, um, again, he didn't call it, uh, you know, he, he, it wasn't a psika, it was sort of a, a policy paper or a policy outline, but providing that framework ha has been very important, not for everyone. Some people just say, you know what, leave me alone. I will live my life. I, I will be affiliated or, or define my orthodoxy as, as I wish. But for many people, it is very, very important um, because, because of, of the, they, they are halakhically committed and they want the halakha to work for them and with them. And can you speak a little bit about the impact of Israel's LGBT community on that in America? That is another audience question. So this is an interesting one, right? Because I, I spent all this time studying the, the Israeli community and I knew a lot about that. And then I come, you know, and I published this book in the U.S. And then, it's, you know, the community asked me, well, what's going on here? So A, um, um, and this will be another shout out to Rabbi Steve Greenberg, who I mentioned earlier, who um wrote sort of one of one of the first kind of uh really sort of deep halachic examinations of 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 gays and halacha um started um an organization called eshel uh, which does a lot of the same work that i um, described in israel which provides support groups um, and education and resources for families etc um, there's an, another one at jqy jewish queer youth um, that does that um, as well the interesting thing is that in some ways, and I learned this after starting talking to audiences in the US, in some ways, Israel is, is a little bit of a head um, because it's such, you know, sort of closer, smaller knit communities. So you mentioned Daniel Jonas and, and, you know, some of these activists, the early activists, especially, not all of them, but many of them were kind of from what we would think of as sort of elite Orthodox backgrounds. They went to like, the best high yeshivas they had rabbinic some rabbinic training they had access to all these community leaders and rabbis so in the beginning this was done kind of you know on the down low not 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 in public purview but the, the, like these conversations would happen um so they could impact and achieve a much bigger kind of um uh, sort of a, a impact quicker than you could in the US. The other part of it, as, as, as Daniel Yona said in, in that um, quote that I brought, there are conservative now, like um, big C, right? Capital C sort of conservative denominations and there are uh, reformed denominations, but they're relatively um, less prominent than they are in the US. So in the US, it's, it's kind of easier to, to find other Jewish homes. Um, so many people kind of find their way there. So uh, there's, there's a back and forth. Um, and I think that some of what has been, what, what has been unfolding in Israel is, is, is spa place specific, but some of the ideas are kind of transferring and there are various organizations kind of that, that, that try to, um, encourage dialogue, et cetera. And many American organizations, listen, activism costs money, right? Um, and and there's not a whole lot of money that goes into it, but but some, some of the money does come from the US, from US um, um, Jewish um, sources that, that help fund um, these organizations. All right. 
Thank you so much, Arit. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, we want to thank everybody for attending uh, Arit's talk. Um, this um, this event was, again, uh, brought to you uh, by the YNS Nazarene Center for Israel Studies. Um, and you can look at the webinar chat. There is a link if you'd like to purchase Arit's book and uh, continue the conversation. Um, you're welcome to um, use it. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful uh, rest of your day. And thank you again, Marie, for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me.